welcome to uh, One Million Cups. My name is uh, Brad Post, and I'm one of the co-organizers here. And just to tell you a little bit about the setup of what we're doing this morning, um, if you haven't uh, been here before, is there any first timers here this morning? Uh, raise your hand or eyes. Glad to have you this morning. Um, just a few kind of house rules. Uh, we've got a thank you, Tim. We've got a bathroom in the back over here. Um, if you could kind of clean up after yourselves, we're using uh, those things area here. Um, but just to kind of tell you what the vision of One Million Cups is, it's basically we're here to um, engage the local entrepreneurs um, to educate the community on local startups and then also to help accelerate their business. Um, the setup is we've got two speakers, two awesome speakers this morning. Um, they will have six minutes to uh, give you their presentation on their company. If you could pay close attention because we're going to have about 20 minutes of questions and answers afterwards. And that's really kind of a, a beneficial part. So I'm going to introduce uh, Reed Tennant. Um, Scott Ayers is on his way up. Um, Reed Tennant is a white label platform for apartment complexes, dorms, and uh, let's welcome Scott this morning. Well, thank you. I'm really excited to be here this morning. I'll tell you briefly about myself. My name is Scott Ayers, and I grew up in Pryor Creek, Oklahoma, 40 minutes from here, with this guy up here, actually, one of my business partners. Um, my two favorite things to put into my stomach are coffee and avocados. Um, I have a wife that is three times, probably three times, four times better looking than I am. Yeah, more. Take it up. But man, just really excited to be here. Um, our company is Retenant. Uh, we kicked off in about March in this company, um, and uh, it's really just been a whole new world to me. I really didn't know this startup world existed, period, much less in Tulsa. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful to Jacob Johnson, a lot of you know him up here, um, because he's kind of drawn me into this world, partnered with me on this project. Um, we came up with this idea, God, it was over a year ago, um, a buddy of mine in Oklahoma City who's not involved in our company now, we're talking about uh, retention in apartments and uh, some technology we could do. And uh, they got together with Jake and just through the whiteboard um, came up with this company. So I'm going to take you through it quickly today and really want to hear your feedback uh, on, on kind of what we're doing. So one of the, the main problem we're addressing is that uh, residents are mobile and apartments are not. So the statistics on mobile usage, you guys know this in the, in the tech space, is, is insane. Smartphone usage, everything's going there. And what we found is apartments um, are, are pretty stone age in how they do things. 70% of them are still using flyers, posting those on doors for their communication. Um, so we'll go through just a couple of comparisons here. You know, residents use phones to communicate, apartments use flyers to communicate. Um, residents use native apps to stay in constant communication with different industries. Um, a lot of management apartments will have um, mobile websites that get about 5% adoption by residents. Um, they use phones to socialize and apartments want community. Any apartment you go into, you sit and having some kind of cookout or volleyball tournament or something to get residents to get to know each other because they want them to have community so they'll stick around. Uh, residents want real-time information. Um, you can see that in social media. They want to know things immediately. Um, Management is concerned about things like security, getting things out to people quickly rather than slapping flyers on 400 doors. Um, residents want service and community, and apartments need retention. So it's really something um, that is, is it's butting heads. I mean, you've got residents that leave from dissatisfaction. They don't know people in their apartment. Um, you see a lot of the reviews online about how maintenance didn't get to what they needed or they didn't feel safe in their place. There's all these things. So there are some things that are out of uh, the apartment's control. Um, people are going to leave because they're moving and they're buying a house. But the dissatisfaction is what we're looking at. And th these are some pretty startling numbers. It actually took us um, some convincing to get investors to believe that retention is this costly. But 85% of property managers said that retaining tenants was their biggest problem. Um, it's cost for an average of three to five thousand dollars every time a resident moves out from the turnover, the loss of rent, the manpower that goes into it, cleaning the place, fixing things. Um, and a 200 unit complex averages about 50% turnover every year. Um, the places I've worked with on our app, you actually can see who's moved out and moved in, and it really is about half for the year. I'm um, costing from three to five hundred thousand dollars a year 
on, uh, on turnover in these places. Um, you can see some of these things, we'll quickly move through this, but you've got loss of rent, it's an average of $4,000 a year for these people, these people to move out. So we're breaking down the cost barrier with our tenant to bring a communication tool to these people that really draws the residents in. It's a white label app and you can see from the illustration here, it gives an apartment their actual app in the iPhone Android store. So we just went into Cascada Apartments on 81st and Mingo, and so they now have the Cascada app. You search Cascada and uh, iPhone or, or an iTunes or a Google Play, you'll find, you'll find the Cascada app in there. Residents can easily download it. It'll show you a couple of features real quick. You can see there's an actual Cascada icon on this iPhone here. It's got a main menu that the resident enters into, and they're in constant connection all of a sudden with one click. They've got a news feed that pushes push notifications out, um, replaces flyers, gives them immediate um, interaction with the property manager. It's got a service feature that gets used. Our first launch, or not our first launch, our launch at Cascada, there, we had a, the app launch down in the clubhouse, and before the launch was even over, there were already 10 service requests sent in to the property manager from the app, from people that had downloaded it, gone out. You can see you can enter their in, you can attach, take a photo on the spot of what it is, it packages it and sends it into them. It's got direct messaging for property managers to communicate directly with residents, push out, you know, you have a package at the front, um, you're being too noisy, those kind of things, back and forth interaction. It's got a click to call menu. It's got a community feature where residents can actually go in and post and connect with each other. And it also has an SMS backbone system to it. So what this does is, for instance, we have the Mayo is one of our customers, the Mayo apartments, and they have about 93 to 94% adoption on the app. But they're, you know, the handful of people that don't use it still get texted. Um, we use Twilio on the backbone to send texts if um, they don't have the app. So, if there's an axe murderer running around the place, four people are still four people on the app are still going to get it as well. Our property managers have the same kind of things they can do. That you can see they can create posts from the phone. They can add posts. They can turn comments off if it's a post they think that people would not take to. Um, they have a send all feature, a direct messaging system, and they also have a dashboard, kind of a service center where they can come in and manage everything from a computer, see all the things that the app is doing. Um, we're a white label platform. Uh, we do it software as service. And I think a lot of these slides are showing up that weren't supposed to. So <laughs> I tried to hide them, but I think they, this is getting a little investor pitchy here, sorry. We have a huge market. You can look at these numbers quickly. But uh, 40,000 uh, properties, over 8 million units nationwide that we're going to be marketing to. I'm at six minutes. Look at that cool, look at those little check marks. <laughs> oh man, oh, here's a few of our customers that we have currently right now. And these are the places we have proposals out to and I need to really stop doing this. And there's our team. So I'm going to leave it on our team here and quickly talk about them and then uh, kind of interact with you guys. You see Jake there, he has with Gitwick Creative. Um, man, he is just bulldogging through, pushing this thing on with all the other things he has going on. Um, and uh, really, really cares about the entrepreneurial community in Tulsa. Ronya Nazardine no, is a, an a former attorney with Gable Gutwell. She is our CEO. You can see me there. Dan Fisher is a PhD in consumer behavior. And then Devin, who is here. Where is Devin? Down in the back. He is our technical guru um, that takes care of us. So I think we're going to take questions now. Um, so fire away. Yeah, go ahead. Right here. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so he asked, uh, did I initially come up with the idea and how did we get to the point where we had user experience and actually built to where we are now? Um, yeah, I, it was a friend of mine in Oklahoma City and we were hanging out at a tea shop, um, all about Shaw. I've been there, but it's so good. Um, and there was a, a guy that owned five apartments here and we just started having a conversation with him, my friends in uh, commercial real estate. And uh, he just talked about retention as a huge problem and how can we fix it. And he left, we started brainstorming the idea of how do you get this thing going, how do you get residents connected, um, and came up with the idea for a white label app. Um, and then so I priced it out to some developers, but you know how that is where you're just kind of trying to figure things out. And then just randomly, I don't know how we were together that day, but Jake and I were just talking about it and it was like right up his alley. And we started to whiteboard the thing out and really develop the idea and get what creative got behind it and kind of pushed us to where we are now with user experience. We had a minimal viable product in a couple months um, that we were able to beta in the Mayo. So yeah, the idea was there, but um, 
there's just no way. What you guys know how it is. I mean, a lot of people have ideas, but it's it was if we didn't have this partnership going on, it wouldn't have got brought together. All right. Here. We do have competitors. Um, we, we are the first to market um, with all of the features in a truly white label app um, that is truly focused on residents. There are some white label apps that are more marketing apps to the outside, which really doesn't make sense to us because most people just go to a website when they're looking to be in an apartment, they're not gonna download their app to check them out. Um, ours is more resident focused. Um, the only one that does a lot of what we do is not white label as in you'd have the Cascada app, but you download their app, the resident would have to know to go download their app, and then it white labels to the apartment after the resident's locked in. So we think adoption's a lot higher in ours. We've got high adoption because somebody that lives at the Cascada um, knows to download the Cascada app. Scott, can you follow her? Oh, go ahead. Follow oh, sorry. I'm supposed so to follow her. Question, how do you, um, how do you maintain your competitive advantage over um, so that's a great question. How do we maintain our competitive advantage over time? Uh, we want to move really fast. Um, our sales strategy, we want to constantly be innovating and um, I'm, I'm on the ground right now with um, residents. We're doing focus groups and property managers. Our user interface has already changed dramatically from what you saw. I'm trying to understand them better. Um, we have national sales partners we're working with to move nationwide quickly um, with brokerage firms. That's who we're working with to push it out quickly and make an impact quickly. So, um, because we know that even some of the places that are guys that are in our space are going to start seeing some of the things we do, like the SMS backbone, and trying to emulate that. You said uh, far away, and I hate to bridge on that, but can you put a public safety kind of uh, application in there so that a manager could? send out alarm, fire alarm kind of thing? And That's a great it. question. We, um, I don't know if any of you have that weather app that puts out that like spine chilling sound whenever something's happening, but we're thinking about the same thing, kind of a neighborhood watch type thing. The property manager can push something out when the ax murderer is in the neighborhood and something's going on, or a weather update or something, or that, that police copter is flying overhead and you just don't know why. Um, so we're talking about doing that and getting that out there as well. It's a good question. Uh, good question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's asking like segment wise, like the different classes of apartments are one more likely to adopt it than another, and then um, do we have to, what kind of contract do they enter into in this thing? Yeah, we have seen that um, for reasons that you wouldn't expect until you got into it. Luxury, it's very appealing to luxury um, in Class A for sure. Um, there are some Class B properties that are right on the edge of Class A that have taken quite a bit of interest in it. We presented to some lower income places, but the problem with those is there's a lot of government phones and their phone numbers are constantly switching. So those places, we don't think we can make quite an impact even with just a texting system, which is why they don't have that already. It's just because so many people's phones are constantly changing and they never know if they're in connection with the residents or not. Um, as for contract, we provide some options to people right now. We're so new that we have a proposal out for a two-year contract. A guy in the city for five apartments right now, and then we have month to month contracts of different pricing breakdown for others. Um, it really depends on what they prefer. We do price by unit though, because that just makes sense to apartments because they budget per unit. Oh, which one? Okay. Um, it takes right now, it depends on how many people we have um, lined up. We're trying to scale development as we bring on new customers. But we think about, and Devin, Devin could chime on this a little better than I could, two to three weeks. Um, but we, yeah, so it's really what, what we're trying to do is gain the ability to white label this thing quickly, because it is native, um, a native app, so it's definitely not just I'm gonna scrape some brand and throw it on a website that we templated out. There is some more development. You gotta push it through Apple and Android. And Apple is a lot hard, more hardcore about pushing something through if anybody's done um, anything through them. It takes a week or two sometimes to get approved through them when Android will put something in like 30 minutes. Because Android just doesn't care. They'll put, it, they'll put any crap on their phone. Yeah, yeah. We have found that, that is a, we have found it's extremely iPhone heavy in the places we've gone into. Um, Mayo was almost all iPhone. There's like two Androids in the entire place. Um, and then uh, Cascada's been about 75% iPhone. 
so far on the downloads. But. Uh, so where do you see, uh, as a company, where do you see yourselves in six months and then in five years? Oh, good. Uh, this guy. <laughs> this guy with these abstract questions. <laughs> um, in six months, I would like to actually I'm the, probably the most optimistic in our company. Everybody's kind of having to rein me in when we're doing forecasts and things because on the ground I see people want it. Um, I would like to have made a pretty strong impact in the six months. Um, I would like to have 150 to 200 customers in six months. Uh, I think we can do it. Um, Devin's back there shaking his head saying, I mean, what are you talking about uh, in the development side? Um, and, and I mean, I want, I want to be invading at that point. Uh, I think we have the ability to do it. Our team would get it behind us. We have the ability to move fast on things. So um, in five years, um, well, I mean, our exit our exit strategy um, definitely looks at companies like RealPage and those to be acquired. And so in five years, I would expect that to have already happened. So, so more specifically, your question about what is your So Devin and Devin can answer this a lot better than I could. Um, oh, I need to repeat the question. Sorry. So we mentioned um, I'll butcher how you just said it. Um, we mentioned he mentioned uh, you know scaling this thing up. You know the time it takes to get in as we scale bigger and bigger. And with something that sounds so custom, you know how do you make that happen? How can that be cost effective moving forward? Um, we believe that we can white label this thing, and we do have some. We're contracting out some places. We do have a little bit of offshore work we're doing. Or we could actually flip this thing around in about half a day is what we're looking to do eventually. Um, white label it and push it over. We're, we're cross-platform into Android. So um, to be able to do that quickly, and that it's getting less and less every time we do it. So our goal is to get the whole process into a half day and have it submitted in the stores. That's kind of, that's what we think will be attractive, honestly, to bigger companies is the system we have and even a lot of the best practices we're doing with apartments to help them implement it in. Cascada, this is one of the most beautiful things about working with property managers is they're typically, most property managers I've met are 20s and 30s women and they are the most hardworking, motivated people and uh, have given me just an understanding of what are the best ways to get people on board, get people down to a launch party, all these things. And it doesn't take much training for them to actually launch it themselves. So as for implementation, we think we can get the development down quickly um, and then have like a package thing we can give to the apartments for them to launch and get real adoption. Roger. Yeah, yeah, so our, our product SaaS model, so um, it's software as a service, so what we do is we've created one platform, like we created a custom app platform that an apartment would pay a lot of money for if they were like, hey, make me this app. I want you to do this, 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 and this. With the user experience and all the things that we've done and the way we, what we brought it to, I mean, I don't know what it would cost, but it would be a lot of money. Um, what we do is we take that platform and duplicate it again and throw some lo throw some logos in. I'm not going to say that one for something. We'll throw your logo on there. Um, we cut, we change the design a little bit and uh, duplicate it, and then make the Cascada app the Mayo app, and then that app is duplicated again, and it becomes this app and this app. So it's able to reproduce, kind of like you would think of like a website platform template that's, that's pushing out. But it's a lot different than what's out there because it is it's still native. So when you have a native app in the iPhone Android stores, it's just immediately becomes more custom to a resident, and they're not going to know. Yeah, yeah, so there is, his question is what other markets have you thought about? That's all I know, that's like the third time I've actually repeated the question, sorry. Um, we have a large list of ones we think we can do, and it's like a battle for us and for me to try and stay focused, but realize that a lot of the features we have would fit that. Come on, a guy that we're going into, a place we're going into in Oklahoma City has a huge neighborhood that he was like, man, I can use this for the Homeowners Association. 
Um, and so we believe white labeling into those as we go, maybe not building a brand around that and marketing them yet, but go ahead and experimenting with it. Um, some other places are timeshares or condos, um, just property management apps in general that cover smaller properties. Um, we've had a lot of interest in that. We actually have proposals out to do that. Um, even to, um, we have a relationship with Montro, am I saying that name right? Or there, because of Jake, um, where it would be a communication tool even between um, residents, families, outside. So we do think it's applicable to a lot of different industries um, and we're, we're definitely, definitely talking about that. Yes, oh gosh, sorry. And yeah, universities, we're actually in a conversation right now for residential life um, with universities to have an app that could be um, a university residential app that white labels to each um, dorm. So, you know, RAs and them can uh, communicate with students and white label it to that as well. So that's a, that's a very exciting prospect for us. And else here? Oh, I got a follow-on question for that. What are the political hurdles that you're facing to get into universities? Because I just look at the full spectrum, both the United States and just our general region. That seems like a much bigger market that, with federal dollars, could help support you in that kind of way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we the conversations about the universities actually started to take place last week. Um, so. <laughs> So I would say my mind has been so on apartments and interacting with them that I would, that would be a, a great question for probably what's been going through the other partners' minds. But um, yeah, I mean, any, that, I mean we, would, we would want to capitalize on anything that, you know, wherever the funding came from or whatever partnerships we could create to, to move forward on something like that, we would not be opposed to, so. The reason I ask is TU is so focused on software development and technology, I feel like they'd be a great test in that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Jake is Jake is very active in, in TU and, and as alumni and stuff. So um, that's 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 a great point, um, and it, it would be a great place to start for us for sure. So it's good. I didn't repeat his question. Sorry. Which one am I going back back here? Yield to the gentleman up here. model with apartments we're licensing it to apartments it's free for residents to download what are some other um, possible revenue streams that we could get and there are several we're exploring um, ad revenue we already have people interested for paying for posts into the app in Cascada a couple of pizza places I'm actually in a conversation with Starbucks right now to do that um, that would be a per post contract that we're doing we're actually talking about splitting that revenue with the apartment and putting it towards their app to motivate them to put more in because the experimentation we've had with putting offers in and hey Cascada residents go get a free appetizer tonight to show them your app has been a huge value out of residents so get on the app in the evening just check that out it doesn't seem spammy or over added to them at all. Another um, revenue stream we're looking at is we're putting in a mobile pay feature so they can pay with their phone. And right now the resident portals that are out there have an $11 convenience fee for a resident to pay it. So the adoption is very low and it's a pain to go onto the website, remember your login and password and do it. So we're talking about having a much cut down, like a $2.99 um, convenience fee that we could take revenue from that as well. I surveyed all the residents at Cascot on that last week and they said from two to four dollars was the most common answer of what they would pay as a convenience fee. Um, so yes, we are talking about that and even having subscription models maybe for advertisers in that where they could just pay a certain amount to have a certain amount of posts monthly as well, so. Is the revenue, if you do that ad, um, does the parking complex get a cut of that or is it all? They get, so he's asking if we do do the ad things, does the apartment complex get a cut? Right now we're talking about they would towards the cost of their app. So if Starbucks is paying 200 bucks a month, we get 100 just added to our revenue share and they get 100 towards their app to cut that cost down, which really just adds to our revenue in the end, but encourages them to make relationships. Because they already have relationships with these people that are posting coupons just like flyers on all the doors that get thrown away, the residents hate it. 
because it's the same thing. They just throw in the trash like they do anything else. But when it comes in and says, hey, Cascada Resident, this is for you, show your app, for some reason it's making sense to them. So. Scott, can you answer the question Yeah, so I was talking to Taylor about how to answer this question <laughs> a little bit ago and not sound like greedy, help my company guy. But a lot of people have connections to multifamily housing and property owners. Um, so you could help a tenant big time by just setting up where I could come show them the app um, because it really sells. So I've walked into about every apartment in Tulsa now. Um, not really much of a, it is a cold call walk-in, I guess you'd call it, but I just engage the property manager, tell them what we're doing, show them the app. And usually when they see the app and they can see that it could be their app, they'll push me up to some that decision maker. So anybody you know, whether they're low on the totem pole or they're the owner of like 50 apartments, I would love to talk to them about it. Um, so uh, my email, um, I think it's, maybe it's on here. Oh, oh, don't look at that. Oh, there it is. So, you can see, you can see my email there, um, scott at retenant.com. Shoot me an email if you have anything like that, or if you'd like to just uh, help us out. Um, we are actually, we're using Envision to send out mock-up apps and get feedback from people. So, um, any help in our company that can connect us to people that um, are in the industry is huge to us. simple today. The announcements were in the middle of Global Entrepreneurship Week. For those of you that are true entrepreneurs and haven't RSVP'd yet, you can RSVP for the I2E event this afternoon. Can they RSVP how, what's, when's the cutoff? Yeah. One minute before? Yeah, they, yeah, they can still RSVP today. Today. But don't feel like you can just show up. Okay, you can show up. Yeah. Awesome. And then we've got SourceLink event on Friday, which you also should come to. And then also at 11.30 today, the Mine has an event over at Tiamo's in the Forge. You should check that out. They've got a global shaper in from New York University. Uh, so, yeah, anyway. All right, our next company is Medify. They told me what they do, and they said you have to say it exactly this way, and I've only heard it one time, so I'm going to say it very slowly and see if I get it right. Ready? They're a medical price transparency tool. Is that right? Yes. All right, give it up for Matt and Lee. Hey guys, thank you very much for having us here this morning. I appreciate uh, everybody showing up. Um, we start, don't start the six minutes yet, I'll never, I'll never make it. Um, Mark knows what I'm talking about. Show of hands, we're going to do a little unscientific poll here. How many people here have ever bought a car? Oh man, almost everybody. Alright, how many here uh, researched the car before you bought it? Oh, okay, how many guys asked for the price of the car before you bought it? Oh, that's so weird, most of you. You know, you might say, well, oh, man, no one would ever do that. No one would ever buy something expensive in a car without finding out the price first. No, you're wrong. It happens all the time, and uh, we call it American Healthcare. We're making car-sized uh, financial decisions without finding out anything about the price or whether that facility or doctor is actually any good. We have no idea. Uh, we just make those choices blindly. So we're building a medical price transparency app, as Tim was saying, to help companies that give health benefits to their employees a way to bend the cost curve down. Uh, the cost of medical services has risen almost 200% in 10 years, uh, while wages have only increased 39%. This is leading to uh, the leading cause of bankruptcy for U.S. employees, and it's also the number one number two cost for U.S. companies. Uh, a little factoid for you. In 2010, Starbucks spent more on their company's healthcare for their employees than they spent on coffee beans. And uh, GM estimates somewhere between two and three thousand dollars is added to each car to pay for their employees' health care. So they're paying for it, you're paying for it, everybody's paying for it, and we're going to help you pay less. So the problem is, employees are running up massive health care bills for their for their companies. Uh, these companies are primarily self-insured, so the cash for these employees' health care is coming out of their own pocket. Uh, they're starting to shovel that more and more the employees, so both are feeling the pinch. Uh, these, like I was saying, these companies are paying these bills directly. And uh, you can't expect an employee to find a better deal on healthcare if they can't look around for it. So basically what we're about to do is build the Travelocity or the Kayak.com of healthcare. One of the crazy things about uh, prices in, in healthcare is that because it's so opaque, the system is so closed, because you have no idea how much you're paying for it, uh, we're finding that it's crazy, uh, the price variance for these, for these different procedures is crazy high. 
uh, somewhere between 100 and 1,000 percent difference in every U.S. city for every procedure done by the same doctors, the same equipment. Um, for instance, in Tulsa, we're finding that a colonoscopy runs somewhere between $407 and $3,500 for the same procedure, just depending on where you go. Uh, it's pretty much throwing a dart on a board. If you go to the $3,500 place, uh, you're going to pay for it, so is your uh, employer a lot more. Uh, we have a little inner office example. Um, both Nathan and our intern this summer got CT scans of the sinuses, actually. Uh, Nathan paid 90 bucks at a great place in South Tulsa, and our uh, intern paid 1700 for the same one at St. John. Um, and his out-of-pocket cost for that was almost 800 bucks. So, as you can see, it pays to shop around if you can. Right now, it's kind of impossible, but we figured out a way to do it. I'll let Nathan talk about the very exciting solution. All right, and so now for the, uh, the actual fun part here. So how do we how do we solve all this problem? It's not just saying um, we're basically building the Travelocity for for healthcare. So it's going to be a web-based price transparency tool. It's also going to be an app too, because we know most people um, you know utilize their phone pretty pretty consistently. Um, so we, we reconstruct the prices in the companies provided work from from data that the company already has. We take that, we take that data, aggregate it all, and identify the lower cost, higher quality facilities. Um, in Tulsa, there's there's a huge amount of doctors, actually really name the city, there's a huge amount of doctors that are charging very reasonable rates, but their quality is also is also very high. So we also we also input quality metrics because we, we know people aren't just going to shop at the price of because healthcare. You know, we obviously want the best quality for the best price. So we show them, we show them the quality, we show them the price, and, and then let them let them make their decision. And the funny thing is, in healthcare, price and quality are not related. Most of the time, the most expensive doctor is actually the uh, lowest quality doctor. It's, it's, it's completely, completely backwards. And then we incentivize those employees to choose uh, the the lowest price, best uh, best quality healthcare that they can get. So here is a uh, results line. This is from uh, our health company that we worked with uh, early last year. Uh, this current uh, procedure up here is for a colonoscopy, which is a price range between four and seven and thirty-five hundred dollars. The distribution is what they actually spent on it for a total cost of uh, just under twelve thousand dollars. I think this was only for 10, 10 actual procedures, so it's, it's pretty uh, it's pretty high. Now we did it our way, and we just shifted. 70% to the to the lowest cost, highest quality provider, and the other ones were evenly distributed through the uh, through the other the other providers. That's a 47% savings, and that's just on this one procedure for tiny people. So I mean, you you know put that over 100 procedures for you know, five or six thousand people. I mean, the savings that you can realize are, are just immense. and this is this is basically the first step. We eventually want to get into more income based uh, healthcare where, you know, say Dr. A is you know, $800 and Dr. B is $300. But based on that doctor's outcomes and patient's uh, health profile, it might be actually cheaper in the long run to send them to the $800 doctor uh, if he has a you know, lower admittance rate or, um, you know, some sort, of, some sort of health related issue that that you know, more expensive doctor is well willing to take care of. Uh, it's going to be a better, a better uh, value in the long run. So right now we're, we're, we're focusing on price and quality, and in the future there's you know, countless things we can do with all this aggregated information and cost trends and price elasticity and all that, all that fun stuff. Thank you for being here. Oh, look at that. All right. Do you have that, guys. Thank you very much. Yes, the lease. Hello. Hello. Great question. Um, on quality metrics, she's talking about the subjectivity. Okay, so when we do quality metrics, we're getting them from independent sources, actually objective data based on readmittance, based on education level, etc. Uh, there is some value in subjective um, reviews. These are like user reviews. Um, there is some, you know, a doctor's bedside manner is important. Okay, they could be a fantastic doctor, but if they don't like being a doctor, that kind of shows. Uh, but I want to minimize that because at the end of the day, the outcome is the most important. Um, you know, we do know, if you guys ever used Amazon and looked at Amazon reviews for things, if the postal service got their product to them slow, 
they'll give it a one star, even though the product would be awesome. We want to stay away from that when we talk about quality metrics because if someone goes to Dr. A and Dr. A is fantastic, he does a great job, but Dr. A's uh, receptionist was rude to them, I don't want them giving two stars out of five for that doctor. So uh, we're going to shy away from user reviews and use more objective reviews and there are services that we garner APIs from that we can actually feed those type of objective reviews into um, for those clinical um, profiles, for those hospital profiles, and, and in some cases individual doctors as well. Good question. So how is the Affordable Care Act going to affect what you guys I was waiting for this. All right, well, I don't want to get in a soapbox about uh, the Affordable Care Act because we'll be here all day, but uh, if you guys have been following in the news, you know that the implementation of the Affordable Care Act has been disastrous, to say the least. Um, the Affordable Care Act has been touted as health care reform, and that's actually a misnomer. It's not health care reform, it is health insurance reform. Um, the ACA does not attack the problem with health care. The problem with health care is that it's too expensive. What it attacks is who's going to pay for that expensive health care. It's a very short-term solution. We actually go the exact opposite direction of the ACA, and we start attacking why is health care so expensive, and how can we make it cheaper? Because there are places in every city where you can get excellent health care for a very, very, very good price, and we want to shuffle people to that. Um, so the ACA, um, we actually circumvent it. Um, it's focusing on who's going to pay for expensive health care. We're focusing on who gets a good deal and sending people there, because honestly, it's an access problem, right? Uh, people having problems accessing affordable health care. That's what Medify seeks to solve, is giving people that access, because if we can solve the affordability problem, the access problem goes away. Nobody wants bread insurance, nobody's looking for milk insurance because people can buy those things, right? The prices are out there, people can see them, and uh, people can afford them. Uh, healthcare can be the exact same way, it has to obey the exact same economic factors as milk and bread. Yes? Yeah, you. Um, uh, I, I have a, a small observation, and the question of my observation is, um, could you come up with any sort of solution that would be colonoscopy? <laughs> Yeah. I'm not really even sure why we chose that one. <laughs> You're looking at the team. Um, my background is business. I have a BS in international business and a BS in marketing from Oklahoma State. I have an MBA from Oklahoma State, and I went to law school for like 20 minutes. I hated it. <laughs> Nathan is uh, BS in civil engineering from Oklahoma State. He's the technical mind. This guy's a genius when it comes to stuff like this. Uh, we are experts because I've studied this problem for two straight years, actually a little longer. Um, we've talked with, I can't even tell you how many people that are experts in this in the industry. Um, and we have, it, this was an idea I got in the shower. And over two, almost a little over two years, we've been working with ITOE to hone the business model into something that was scalable nationally uh, and one that was very user friendly as well. So. Um, so, what is your defensibility or why, why is Cerner or has they talked about Jeez, I get the good one. Well, you know, I mean, essentially any, any company with, you know, million dollars could probably solve just about any problem that anyone has in the industry. But you know, I mean, this is this is out of the the general scope of Cerner or a lot of different you know, hospital systems or insurance companies. And a lot of a lot of insurance companies are actually doing something similar to this, but they have a vested interest in not you know really revealing the prices for all the broad networks because they they hold that stuff pretty close. So you know, we could uh, tell people that it is probably will they. If it's not in their, you know, scope or space, probably not. And I'm sure, you know, in the next five or ten years, we're going to see copycats, you know, all over the place for all of this stuff. Have you seen any other startups that are... Um, there are uh, three, I think three or so, people that are that are pretty new in the space, um, doing the model we do. There, there's a lot of people doing the public side of the model, which is, you know, the website out there, but, uh, you know, doctors, cash pay rates, uh, Medicare data, hospital data, because that, all that data was just released. Ago, so there's a lot of people posting that data uh, available. Now, it doesn't really tell you exactly how much you're going to pay. It doesn't interact with your benefits package, uh, your HSA package, plus the accounts, all of that stuff. Because depending on you know, um, your specific benefits package, your uh, price you for that doctor can change. So you know, say you have a capital as well. Have you got a good deductible to cover that? Are you into your home insurance part? So all that stuff can factor into our numbers. So you can actually get a pretty, pretty close uh, estimate. Uh, 
Uh, yes, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Her question was basically, um, can you send doctors, you know, within your provider network? And it's going to be it's going to be company based. So so every uh, employer is going to get it from their doctors. Uh, and, and and if it also makes sense, the doctor is cheaper and higher quality to send them out of network. Uh, you know, they're probably doing that also. Or say it to you know, Maine for a His question was basically, how do you how do you uh, make it comfortable for people to be at a more transactional basis with healthcare rather than uh, you know, more personal experience with a primary care physician? And uh, you know, as far as primary care visits, uh, for most companies that you know that's you know five, six, seven thousand or so um, you know, visits, but that, that's a relatively low low cost for a lot of a lot of companies. And depending on how uh, uh, how expensive procedures are and situation that the employee is in is going to really impact that because you know for instance I'm, I'm really price sensitive so you know am I going to go to my, my primary care physician which I've gone through for five years if he's three hundred dollars or you know the clinic down the road is fifty bucks you know so or you know a knee surgery you know I mean they like a knee arthroscopy rate is between about thirty five hundred and about seventeen thousand dollars so you know do I want my you know pal doctor to do it for seventeen thousand or can I only afford thirty five hundred dollars so um, you know, basically, 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 huge price variance in people's uh, you know, wallets and payment points. It's going to be a huge benefit. Does that Okay, so that's true. But actually, we're seeing a shift in the model. Whereas companies can no longer afford to pay the size premiums they are, we're starting to shift more of the cost onto, these are called consumer-based uh, health plans, CDHPs, there's also HSAs, HRAs, flex plans. Uh, companies are actually starting to do much more cost sharing with the employee. So the employee who has to take on a larger burden of this, they're not just paying a premium check every month. Uh, they're paying 20% of it after their deductible is met. Or they have a huge deductible that they want to save as much money on as possible. You know, these companies are making it very attractive for their employees to save as much money as possible. But if their employees have no tools to help them save, it frustrates them. And we know from survey data that's exactly what's happening right now. There's a gap between the company saying, here's you know, $5,000 in your HSA, go get a good deal, or you have a $5,000 deductible before we even do anything, so you better save the money as much as you can, or after your deductible's up, you have to pay 20% you know, co-insurance or whatever. These employees are now paying off a lot of money out of their own pocket for this stuff. Um, and also, to address your earlier question about the transactional nature, a lot of these particular procedures are transactional in nature. Um, you know, you might be really, um, you know, good friends with your pediatrician, or you know, you really your wife really likes your pediatrician or not. But do you care as much who does your knee surgery or who gives you a colonoscopy or a CT scan, right? These are more transactional in nature. And so, right, we're back to colonoscopies. You know, we really like to talk about that apparently. Uh, you know, these are much more transactional in nature anyway. Um, and so people are looking to save money primarily as well as good good position. So yes. Our main uh, client are self-insured companies, so they're actually actively doing that when they use Medify because they're paying. See, the difference between fully insured and self-insured is this. Uh, you know, people don't always know this. Fully insured are like the traditional health insurance where they pay premiums and the insurance company picks up all the time. Self-insurance actually acts as their own insurer. They're, whenever their employee goes to get a knee arthroscopy or they go to get uh, you know, whatever kind of surgery or procedure, the company's actually paying that out of their own pocket. So they have a vested interest in seeing it kept low. It's actually most companies in America do this. Um, and we're starting to see a lot more small companies start moving towards this because people that self-insure get to avoid a lot of the mandates and complications that come with the Affordable Care Act. So there's kind of a stampede towards self-insurance as it is. Um, in the future, I would really love to encapsulate more, hey, you should consider self-insurance and then medify. That's something we might consider doing. Uh, but 
I can't divide my forces too much, you know, I'll tell you that. But that's a good question. That's kind of the future. Taylor. Where are you in the development and sales process, and what are some of the big milestones that you guys have to meet? Okay, good question. Where are we in the development process? We just we exited the alpha development phase in July. We've kicked off beta, uh, where we're building a public or uh, a program that's publicly facing uh, that can be actually used by employees, as well as a very complex analytics and algorithm engine on the back end. Uh, the front end of this is super easy to use. The back end is extremely complex. Um, we're talking about high-level data analysis. We're talking about um, grouping. We're talking about uh, algorithm with, very, with uh, many different variables to, uh, you know, help these employees select what's best for them. And the algorithm has different variables in it as well. Uh, so we're moving into beta uh, sales-wise. We have a beta partner. We are about to be connected with a couple of other very large beta partners, uh, and we hope to exit beta by the summer and have a saleable product that you guys can download, like. Scott's app, so you can actually see it in action. So basically, what what is the um, company size that we need to get the you know most accurate view of their of their doctors, and then you know, would we combine that with uh, you know set it on a state or you know, a few hours of getting a better pay? And um, right now we're looking at companies that are around a thousand insured lives, so that's employees and dependents. Also, uh, we feel that we can get a pretty good picture of their total healthcare spend for the last few years, and then we can project that over the next few. Um, and as far as you know, setting them you know across state lines or Anywhere, um, you know, we're, we're, we're completely open to that. I mean, if a doctor you know, in Northwest Arkansas wants to post his prices on our site, um, you know, we'll be happy to send him there as long as it makes sense uh, financially and uh, quality wise to So he's asking, how do you, how, like, how do you find a doctor? How do you, how do you find procedures? Um, it's going to be set up a variety of ways. Um, we'll probably have uh, a search bar that auto completes. So you can type something in. And, um, we can have you know, search by search by uh, type of issue that you're having, uh, list of issues, and we're we're really going to be playing around with that uh, once we have a beta product and we're, we're testing it with about three or four companies, figuring out what works best for people, um, you know, what screens they want to see. How to influence it, you can choose. You know, so it's going to be probably a variety of ways, and it's going to be changing quite a bit. So it seems to me that you're trying to automate the medical tourism industry to a degree, offering where cheaper, higher quality care can happen. How do you differentiate yourself from organizations like the Holmes Group that does in person, in depth analysis of cost and quality and it helps walk? Through the process. Sure, sure. They um, they focus a lot on higher higher dollar procedures. So, for instance, like, like if you're getting a uh, you know bigger shirt that's going to cost you seventy eight nine thousand um, dollars, they they pretty pretty solely focus on you know super super large procedures. Um, we're also doing that, and they're also doing pretty much every procedure across the board. So we're 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 not really only you know keeping ourselves in high dollar procedures. We're also doing you know, office business still. Question that have you thought about acting as a supplement to a homes group? Saying we're going to help um, you know, we're open to anything like that. Uh, there's literally a million different ways we want to take this, and it's really hard not to get scattered and run in a fifty different directions because it's such a wide market right now. So we're basically trying to focus on just two, you know, two or three main things. You know, get a get a beta up, get it going, and then from there expand into all sorts of different uh, different, different sectors. Really like your uh, logo. <laughs> uh, not really. We, we went through about 70 different names, shot down most of them. They're yeah, so so. But um, you know, we like the logo. We um, uh, actually created ourselves, um, and you know, nothing really super crazy behind it. Just uh, a lot of fit well. Yeah.
kind of brings to mind, this is gonna sound really lame, it kind of brings to mind like a flame, like it's kind of lighting up what was once unknown. This guy got it. So there is kind of some symbolism to it. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> 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 okay, that's good. So if any of you guys know anybody in HR or CFO of companies that do self-insure and give uh, health benefits to their employees, um, you know, please introduce us. I'd love to talk with them. You know, we're, we're getting a lot of metrics that way. Um, you know, or if any of you guys, you know, have a story about how much you paid, you know, versus what you found out later was a better place. That's great too because anecdotal evidence is to me just as important. So you know, anybody that's in HR knows HR knows a CFO who may have a, a problem like this, uh, we'd love to talk to them and engage them. So, yeah, primarily local. We want to do our beta here in Tulsa because that's where we're located. Um, it doesn't have to be. Uh, the system works great regardless of where you are. But yeah, I prefer local just for the face-to-face -face type of time for right now. I won't turn anyone down right now. I don't have that luxury, I'm small. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested in helping the smaller guy if I can make it work. Um, I eventually, we have an idea on how we can do that anyway, uh, but I'll talk to anybody right now. But yeah, generally, the larger the better. Uh, yeah, actually, we are. Um, I want to stay local. I've done out of state and out of hemisphere development before and it can really slow things down just because of the communications barrier and time zone gap. Um, I like having real-time development and I like having people in the room with me when we do it. I just, we pivot a lot faster that way. So yeah, absolutely. Right, guys, thank you very much. <laughs> Alright, just to recap, the two asks there. Scott at retenant.com is looking for property managers. And then, what is it, mscoville at medify.com? Right there? Okay, same thing, all right. Uh, next week, we will not be meeting. Happy Thanksgiving. The following week, we will. We've got a great lineup, so you don't want to miss that. Bring your friends. No dogs yet. We'll see if we can wave that policy for dust. All right, have a good day. we got a couple more events, so go support everybody. Thanks.